I hope I will not speak too fast, that the translation will work, and I'm really glad to be here again. I'm grateful to you. I also admire Ediciones Akal and others who regularly publish my work here, and especially with you, you were, I can more or less, I understand Spanish, I followed what you said, and you know, I was almost like uh, waiting, just good thing, then I was asking myself, but you must be sharpening your knife in the back of you, so where is, are you keeping this for questions to the end or whatever, you know. Uh, because what I will say today, it will be more a political talk. What I will say today will be put in a very problematic way. I hope some of you will react even violently. <laughs> because I really see our situation today as very controversial in the sense of it's a paradoxical situation. In what sense? Let me begin with the title of my talk, a plea for bureaucratic socialism. Now, your first reaction is, this must be another of my stupid postmodern jokes or paradoxes and so on. So I cannot emphasize enough that I mean this title in a totally positive, naive way. I think we have to reinvent bureaucratic socialism. Socialism which will be alienated, but alienated in the right way. What do I mean by this? Uh, Jean-Claude Milner reports that when he was young, he was sitting at a table with Louis Althusser, Althusser who once, in a coffee table debate, said something surprising and I think very intelligent. Althusser says that there are three types of revolutionaries. Those who use old proverbs, those who use no proverbs, and those who invent or use new proverbs. And I think this is an excellent definition. For Althusser, for example, he noticed how Stalin from early 30s like to use old Russian proverbs, old wisdoms, and so on. How Robespierre mostly used no proverbs, another revolutionary figure, and how Lenin and Mao, even when they pretend to repeat old proverbs, they are really inventing new proverbs. And I agree with Althusser that this is the task of a true revolutionary. Why? Proverbs, they stand for accepted wisdom. And it's easy to overturn, to make fun of old proverbs. The really difficult thing is to invent new proverbs. What do I mean by this? Uh, the well-known Hollywood producer, Sam Goldwyn, he was a genius, I think, for all his apparent primitivisms, nonsenses, but which we know today they were well planned. And one story about Sam Goldwyn is that he read in a newspaper some journalist criticizing films produced by his studio for using too many old cliches. And he immediately wrote a memo to his screenplay scenario department saying we urgently need new cliches and he was right and that's what we need politically today i will present you quite brutally naively it will be a very naive talk what i will do it today my thesis i am sick and tired of revolutionaries or protest movements which 
focus on those ecstatic moments. Oh my God, one million people on Syntagma Square, on Tahrir, in Istanbul, and so on. We were also enthusiastic there, and so on, and so on. I'm not impressed by that at all. I think this is even relatively easy to do. The true test of a revolution or a radical social change is how do ordinary people experience the change when the ecstatic moment is over, when things return to normal? That's the most difficult task. When nothing happens, when just everyday life is here, how is this everyday life different from the previous everyday life? Which is why I was never fascinated by all those comparisons uh, between revolution and carnival. You know, Mikhail Bakhtin, the fellow traveler of Russian formalists, developed this point nicely on how, apropos François Rabelais, he developed this, how we have those wonderful moments in social life where social hierarchy disintegrates, a slave is a master, a master is a slave, everything is turned around, there is sudden freedom, old rules no longer apply, and so on, and so on. And some stupid leftists took this as a paradigm of the revolution. Now, my friend, I don't always agree with him, but here I do, Boris Groys, the Russian theorist working in Germany, told me a wonderful thing. Recently, they discovered some manuscripts of Mikhail Bakhtin in Kazan. Why? He was exiled there in the age of Stalinism. That's how he survived. And it's clear from those manuscripts what was for him carnival. It wasn't a liberating experience. The secret reference was Stalinist purges. This was for Bakhtin, the true carnival. Today I'm member of a central committee, tomorrow I'm prisoner in Gulag, and so on and so on. This total chaos in social hierarchy. So there is nothing subversive in it. The true problem, again, is not to say we need a release of fresh energy. Our life should not be ossified in fixed structures and so on and so on. No, it should be ossified, but in different structures. That's the difficult thing to do. It's easy to have, again, ecstatic moments of freedom. Oh, we are all free. Okay, we are free for one week, for three weeks, for five weeks, and then? And then? That's why, if you permit me to repeat an old joke of mine, that's why I find very problematic the film, which many leftists like very much, I don't, uh, V for Vendetta, if you saw it. <laughs> you remember the final scene? Wonderful, ecstasy, carnival. The crowd penetrates the police cordon, enters the parliament, people take over. But, as I like to say in my tasteless way, I'm ready to sell my mother into slavery, to see a film called V for Vendetta Part 2. Okay, <laughs> the people have won. What happens the next day? What new laws do they pass? How do they do it? How do they reorganize state apparatus? And so on and so on. So now I will go more in detail and in where I see the problem. And again, I am on purpose provocative. When one hears anarchists, deploying their idea of local communities which work in a transparent way with no alienated representative mechanisms, with all members engaged in organizing their lives. One should recall that their survival of these non-alienated local communities relies on a thick texture of alienated institutional mechanisms, where do electricity and water come from? Who guarantees the rule of law? To whom do we turn for health care? And so on. The more a community is self-ruling, 
the more this network has to function smoothly and invisibly. So maybe we should change the goal of emancipatory struggles from overcoming alienation to enforcing the right kind of alienation. How to achieve a smooth functioning of alienated, invisible social mechanisms which sustain the space of our local non-alienated lives. You know, we all like this idea. We are a community, we debate all the time, but are we aware how many things must function in the background for this to be possible? And we have an old name for these alienated mechanisms, bureaucracy, which is why the left needs today to reinvent bureaucratic socialism. The standard characterization of Stalinist regimes as bureaucratic socialism, I think, is totally wrong. It is the way the Stalinist regime itself perceived its problems, the cause of its failures and troubles. Stalinists always claimed if there are not enough products in the stores, if authorities do not respond to people's demands, and so on and so on, then they always blamed the bureaucratic attitude of indifference, and so on and so on. No wonder that from the late 20s onwards, Stalin was writing attacks on bureaucracy, on bureaucratic attitudes. But I think that paradoxically, what didn't function, not, it's not that Stalinism was too bureaucratic. It wasn't bureaucratic enough. Nothing functioned. Bureaucracy didn't function, really. That's why Stalinism had to live all the time through an emergency state. Stalinism is for me precisely the failure of bureaucracy. What does this mean for our world today? Uh, what happened in Greece? How did we end up where we are today? And it's a very sad thing, where are we? This is maybe the best indication of the confusion of our predicament. Hey, if you want today a minimal series of measures which, at least in some sense, they serve workers, workers' interests, students, and so on, Usually, it's quite often right-wing populist regimes who are the only ones who dare to do this. For example, in Poland, where you have uh, the Kaczynski brother, Jan Kaczynski, one of the two, the other died, uh, the de facto ruler of Poland. Uh, you know that now they enacted incredible set of reforms. They lowered retirement age, made it easier for students to get loans and so on, health care and all that. Only a radically right-wing nationalist government can do this. And on the opposite, isn't it said that if you want the toughest austerity measures, the best one to do it is a radical left party in power. Just imagine if in Greece, conservatives, new democracy, were to remain in power. Syriza, in opposition, would have probably organized massive demonstrations and so on and so on. With Syriza doing the austerity measures, the demoralization is total. So what went wrong? I think that, again, that great disappointment, you remember, on one day two years ago or when, Syriza won the referendum, surprisingly, for themselves. I know from Varoufakis that Tsipras was totally shocked. He wanted honorably to lose the referendum. Uh, they won the referendum, literally one day later they capitulated. I don't blame them. I'm not saying, oh, traitors and so on. It's a real difficulty of the left today. Again, the difficulty of the day after. Okay, you triumph, referendum, but what to do the next day? So there is a narrative now emerging about Greece. The idea is that when Syriza was approaching power, the Tsipras leadership made a series of decisions, not only about the political party line, but also about the type of party 
they needed. They advocated the transformation of Syriza from a coalition of disparate organizations and civil movements into a unified, centralized party. The great number of members of its central committee made it sure that de facto decisions were made in advance in a narrow informal circle around Tsipras, the so-called paracenter of power. So it's easy then to claim that the problem of Syriza was that it became an alienated uh, party elite running the state and that it lost contact with its social base, with civil movements, trade unions, protest movements, and so on and so on. And then the obvious solution is we should rejuvenate, reunite this basis in popular movements. But I think that this analysis is totally misleading. Where Syriza failed is not in simply accepting the logic of state and abandoning its roots in civil movements, but to find a new way how to reorganize the state. It's not enough to say we have to keep always the pressure of the people, presence of grassroots organizations, and so on and so on. Yes, but how, what does this mean for the state itself? How to reinvent the state itself? Because again, as all great revolutionaries, from Robespierre to Lenin and Trotsky knew very well, you cannot maintain a permanent emergency state. Well, people all have an attitude of permanent mobilization. We are always active and so on and so on and so on. Again, the problem is how to do it when things return to normal, when people get tired of being permanently mobilized. Then you need, maybe not the state, we have it, but you need some alienated mechanisms and I'm not afraid of liking them. Listen, now I will make a personal confession for which some of you will probably want to lynch me. Can you imagine me living in a small community where every afternoon we have to debate how we distribute water, how we, uh, uh, take, uh, to, how we do the kindergarten, care for the children, how this, how that. It would be hell for me. <laughs> I want to live in peace. I want invisible, I want to live my life of reading books, watching movies, writing about them. And I simply want an efficient, invisible mechanism to take care of all that. <laughs> and I don't think there is anything bourgeois or whatever in this. The challenge is to build this in a different way, outside the scope of capitalism and so on and so on. I will even go a step further here when we talk about popular pressure, popular mobilization. The long history of universal suffrage in the West shows that vast majority of the people is, as a rule, passive, caught in the inertia of survival, not ready to be mobilized for some cause. That's why every radical movement is always constrained to a vanguard minority, and in order to gain hegemony, it has to wait patiently for a crisis, usually war, which provides a narrow window of opportunity. In such moments, an authentic vanguard, avant-garde, can seize the day, mobilize the people, and take over. And communists here, and I'm not criticizing them, I admire them, were always utterly non-dogmatic here, ready to parasitize on another issue. Remember that October Revolution gained support, not with we want socialism, but with land and peace. Uh, Chinese Communist Party, its slogan was national liberation and unity against corruption. So communists were always aware that mobilization will be soon over and they were carefully preparing the power apparatus 
to keep them in power at that moment. So this betrays another big problem of the Western Marxism. Where is the revolutionary subject? How is it that the working class does not complete the passage, as we say in Hegelian terms, from in itself to for itself? How is it that it doesn't constitute itself as a revolutionary agent? This is why, a very vicious remark, all Marxists really like very much psychoanalysis. Why? They claim we have the best theory that explains uh, economic crisis and so on. But then this theory predicted the emergence of proletariat as a revolutionary agent. And then when you ask them, the communists, I am one of them, by the way, when you ask them, but why is there no revolution? They say, eh, for, to explain this, we need psychoanalysis. To, to describe the deep manipulation and so on and so on, uh, whatever. Uh, and uh, for this reason, Western Marxism was also all the time in search of uh, other social agents which could play the role of the revolutionary agent. Students, uh, third world peasants, intellectuals even, and I think this is the lowest point with all my support for refugees. This is why I find this horrible. Some of the leftists uh, celebrate refugees. Why? Their idea is this one. We have good revolutionary theory. We just don't have a revolutionary agent. Maybe if we import refugees, they will fill in this gap and we will be able to make a revolution in Western Europe with enough refugees. I find this obscene. It means like outsourcing the revolutionary subject, you know. We don't have a revolutionary subject, we will import it. Uh, so, uh, because of this situation, we are today in a unique predicament which is really tragic, namely, let me return to Marx. Marxism was right about the so-called final crisis of capitalism. We are clearly entering it today, I claim. If you look at the signs, all the problems we're encountering, ecology, refugees, uh, biogenetics, financial capital, and so on, and so on. Um, my God, even official ideologists, like whom I really hate, I think they're more dangerous than Trump even, these pseudo-progressive uh, liberal corporate leaders, like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Elon Musk, and so on. The, this is the big slogan today. Capitalism is disappearing, and so on. Uh, they are right. But you know where Marxism obviously went wrong? The idea of Marxism was that when capitalism will be disintegrating, there will be another agent waiting to take over and bring capitalism to the higher stage. But today, and this was unthinkable for Marx, we only have disintegration. But no progressive force taking it over. Or to put it in another way, on the one hand, and this is the tragic split, on the one hand, we have all these protest movements against capitalism, uh, against neocolonialism, against uh, uh, precarious workers, and so on and so on or protesting, uh, uh, protesting, uh, uh, how do you call it, when you don't have jobs, uh, joblessness, uh. <laughs> sorry? Yeah, yeah, but you know what's so sad here? First, let me ask you a common sense question. I never understood it, why are people afraid of robotization that it will take them their jobs? Isn't this wonderful? We'll have to work less. Isn't this shows how deeply perverted our universe. Instead of saying, fine, work less, we see in this the extreme panic. 
oh my God, we will lose our jobs. This is a very sad sign, which shows that the left really doesn't have a vision. So again, at the same time that we have all these protest movements, we have, they were described at different levels, and these descriptions are, are way too naive. I don't trust them, but nonetheless, like Paul Mason, uh, Jeremiah Rifkin, and so on, they describe how capitalism is reaching its end, how through digitalization, market economy can no longer dominate the entire production, and so on and so on. But the, so really, we can see in these processes of digitalization, automatization, already the roots of a post-capitalist world. But no link between this and most, at least, of the protest movements. So let me quote you a German sociologist who wrote a wonderful collection of essays called How Will Capitalism End? Wolfgang Streeck with two E's. Is it translated into Spain? It's worth reading. Uh, here is a quote from him. It is a Marxist or better modernist prejudice that capitalism as a historical epoch will end only when a new better society is in sight and a revolutionary subject ready to implement it for the advancement of mankind. This presupposes a degree of political control over our common fate, of which we cannot even dream after the destruction of collective agency. And indeed, the hope for it in the neoliberal globalist revolution. So again, the thesis of Streck is, yes, capitalism is disintegrating, but according to Marxist doxa, this disintegration should be the very moment of the rise of a new revolutionary subject, which doesn't happen. I'm not saying this is a spontaneous process. The whole effort of today's ideology goes into what? How does ideology today function? It appears precisely as its opposite as a radical critique of ideological utopias. I think that the predominant ideology today is not a positive vision of su some utopian future, but a cynical resignation, an acceptance of how the world really is. The acceptance accompanied by a warning that if we want to change the world too much, only a totalitarian horror can be the final result. So, every vision of another world is dismissed as ideology. Alain Badiou put it in a wonderful and precise way. He wrote that the main function of ideological censorship today is not to crush actual resistance. This is the job of repressive state apparatuses. But to crush hope, to immediately denounce every critical project as opening a path at the end of which there is always something like gulag. And uh, this, let's call it post-ideological ideology, ideology whose entire identity is based on denouncing every progressive hope as ideology, this is how ideology functions today. And this functioning of ideology also accounts for uh, some strange events taking place today. What do I mean by this? Uh, an old Chinese curse is, it's not really Chinese, it's just some Englishman I spoke with my Chinese friends. Some Englishman claimed that he heard it in China, but nobody knows about this in China, okay? It's that when you really hate someone, you tell him, may you live in interesting times. Because interesting times are, of course, the times of troubles, confusion, and suffering. And it seems that in some of our democratic countries, we are really witnessing now a strange phenomenon which proves that we live in interesting times. Do, did you notice how 
For example, apropos Macron in France, a candidate emerges and wins elections as it were from nowhere, in a moment of confusion, building a movement around his name. Both Berlusconi and Macron exploded like this. But what is this process a sign of? Definitely not a sign of any kind of direct popular engagement beyond party politics. On the contrary, we should never forget that such figures explode with the full support of social and economic establishment. Their function is precisely to obfuscate, mystify actual social antagonisms. People are magically united against some demonized fascist threat. This weird phenomenon is, I think, one of the visible effects of the long-term rearrangement of the political space in Europe. Today, we no longer have two big parties, as you also in Spain, you had them till some, uh, I don't know when, five, ten years ago. You know, left-center party, right-center party, and then you have some marginal parties, but basically the two parties replace each other. And all phenomena like Trump, like Le Pen, and so on, signal in this direction that this standard duality, moderate left, moderate right, is disappearing. More and more, one party presents itself as what some people call a radical center. It's the party of status quo, usually it's the party of global capitalism, but at the same time, socially very liberal. They don't have any problem with, with, with pride parades of gay people, with abortion and so on and so on. This is the establishment. And then against it, we have anti-immigrant racism, populism, and so on and so on. And you must have noticed what disappears here, a more radical left. We saw this clearly in the case of Macron in France. I was also one of the marginal victims attacked there because while, of course, I agreed that Le Pen is a catastrophe, I just wanted to signal that Macron nonetheless stands for the establishment. He is the candidate of the establishment. And I find it very sad that, okay, it's nice to say we need anti-fascist unity against Marine Le Pen. But it's very sad to see a candidate of pure establishment, don't have any illusions, the entire economic, ideological, journalist, TV establishment was full speed supporting Macron. And if you just hinted some critical point against him, what happened was that you were immediately denounced as, uh, as, 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 uh, as, as objectively supporting Marine Le Pen. Some of my ex-friends in France even invented the term Le Pen or Trotskists, <laughs> claiming that Mélenchon is objectively working for, uh, working for uh, Marine Le Pen. How do these movements look? Already the names of these movements sound familiar in their empty universality, sorry, which fits everyone and everything. Berlusconi's motto was Forza Italia. <laughs> With uh, Macron, it was La République en marche. So they both designate just an abstract sense of victorious movement forward without any specification of the direction we should pursue. Both movements exploded as reactions of the establishment in a panic. There is, of course, an obvious difference between the two, Berlusconi and Macron. Berlusconi entered the scene when after the big anti-corruption campaign, the entire traditional political configuration in Italy collapsed and ex-communists remained as the only viable force. So Berlusconi's mobilization was against 
what he perceived in the establishment as a communist threat. While Macron entered the scene when Le Pen's neo-fascist populism was perceived as a potential winner. Uh, Macron's role is best described by a word used by some of his supporters. In the last years, they claim, Marine Le Pen was gradually de-diabolized, perceived as part of the normal, acceptable populist political space. And the task is to re-diabolize her, to make her diabolic again, to show to the public that she is the same old anti-Semitic fascist, not to be tolerated, tolerated by any serious Democrat. But I think such a gesture is not enough. It's not enough to re-diabolize Le Pen. If you want to be serious, we should do what the duty of the left is, to ask how a phenomenon like Le Pen was possible. What made it possible? It's clear what made it possible. The failure of the establishment of the predominant hegemonic politics. So I think that when we have the battle like the one in France, Macron, popular unity against the fascist threat of Marine Le Pen, I think we should always ask ourselves, yes, but who is missing from the picture? A more radical left. And I think that the true task of Macron was not just to defeat Marine Le Pen, but to not just defeat, to make disappear a more radical leftist option. It's the same in the United States even. I know what horror Donald Trump is, but I claim that the U.S. Democrats diabolize Trump as the evil horror and so on, in order to get rid of Bernie Sanders, who poses a threat to the democratic establishment. This is why, although I don't doubt that there is truth in it, but this is why we witness in the United States this weird obsession of a democratic party with a Russian hacking of the election. Probably there was some hacking, but nonetheless, the true failure was their own dismissal of Sanders. I claim Hillary Clinton lost because she got rid of Bernie Sanders' wing in her own party. And that's why you need Trump as a Russian agent, so that the image remains. We would have won, only we lost because of Putin and so on. In this way, we no longer have to ask critical questions, it's just the objective situation. Another thing that is part of this new space that is emerging, populism versus establishment, is the saddest thing, maybe, I claim, is what some people call great regression, the rise of public obscenity. And here, Democrats in the United States were spectacularly wrong about Trump. Did you notice something so weird? How many times Trump said something which appeared catastrophic for liberals, and then there were predictions, oh, Trump just committed public suicide, he is out. You remember when, he, when his tapes were disclosed where Trump is boasting how he was touching freely women between their legs, or when he made fun of the father of an American war hero and so on, all that. How they were wrong, the Democrats. They thought now he is finished. No, his, he, his, these apparent scandals just helped him. Why? Let's go to the end. Many of my friends even ask a question, how can a corrupted, lewd, destitute person, vulgar like Donald Trump, the very opposite of Christian decency. How can he function as the chosen hero of the Christian moral majority conservatives? The usual answer that I hear is that they know what kind of a scum moral conservatives Trump is, but they care just about one of, or two points of his program. 
he promised to, for example, abolish or at least limit abortion. So they claim, we don't care. We know he is come, what kind of person he is, but if he does this, limit abortion, it's a great thing. And of course, some other things. But I don't think this is the case. I think that something more complex is at work here for which we need psychoanalytic theory of identification. You know, when Trump made all these failures or mistakes, vulgar remarks and so on, brutal, almost openly racist, anti-feminist, at that point people identified with him because what do they see in Trump? A person who professes to be Christian, high principles, but in reality he's a greedy, sexist, vulgar guy. But these are neoconservatives today. It is, they don't have to be disappointed in what Trump is. That's what they are. They identify precisely with both sides of Trump. So I think that, I don't have time to go into it now, that this should be a chance of the left today with people like Trump and so on. We, we should, the left should emerge, and I think, if I'm well informed, I don't know enough about you that Podemos is trying up to a point to do this. Let's not leave to the right-wingers a nice term, there is nothing wrong in it about moral majority. The only true moral majority is the left today. With figures like Trump and so on, it's over. And let me give you another example of this. Public figures of great morality, but where you see this other side of obscene vulgarity. A friend from Poland told me this, and I was shocked. Poland's de facto ruler, I already mentioned him, sorry, it's not Jan, Jaroslaw Kaczynski made an interview in 1997 for the big liberal newspaper Gazeta Wyborcza, where when he described how his party will take over, he used an incredibly vulgar exclamation, and he didn't disown it afterwards. He proudly insists on it. He exclaimed uh, in Polish, teraz kurwa my. It means it's our fucking term. But I asked my Polish friends, and they claim that although the meaning of this phrase is, it's our fucking time, now we are in power, it's our term. But the literal meaning of this phrase is something much more vulgar. It's something like, now it's our time to fuck the whore. In a like, you know, this vulgar lower class idea a paid prostitute is slaying, and we wait, not the two of us. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, well, maybe, you never know where we are. No, but sorry. But we, uh, yeah, we wait in term, and you finish, and then I say, it's my, it's my turn. Uh, but it's important that this phrase was publicly uttered by a devout Catholic conservative protector of Christian morality. And again, I think... This is precisely why people identify with him. It's not that people think he's a great moralic figure and then they are disappointed. My God, how? No. Both sides are part of the hegemonic ideology. Okay, just to amuse you a little bit, it's incredible how communists in power also are not far behind with similar vulgarities. For example, it will shock you, in his speech at the Lushan Party Conference in 1959, just when uh, it became clear that things are not doing well with the fiasco of Great Leap Forward, that the result is mass hunger, millions dying, and so on. Mao called the party cadre to assume their part of responsibility. He said, you know, we failed with great leap forward, millions of farmers are dying, we made serious mistakes, and he said that the greatest is my own responsibility, especially for the unfortunate campaign to make steel, steel, like, uh, steel, in every village. And then comes the surprise. 
This is not one hidden part in the middle. These are literally the last lines of his speech. The chaos caused was on a grand scale, the chaos of Great Leap Forward, and I take responsibility. Comrades, you must all analyze your own responsibility. Listen now. If you have to shit, shit. If you have to fart, fart. You will feel much better for it. End of it. Now, why this vulgar metaphor? In what sense can the self-critical admission of one's responsibility for serious mistake, mistakes be compared to the need to shit and fart? I presume the solution is that for Mao, to take responsibility does not mean so much an expression of remorse, which may even push me to offer to step down. It's more that by doing it, you get rid of responsibility so that no wonder you feel much better for it, like after a good shit. You don't admit you are shit, you get rid of the shit. I mean, are you, again, I, are you, that's the only way I can read, are you aware of this utter vulgarity? When Mao is taking about, talking about his responsibility for death of millions, his metaphor for admission of guilt is like shitting, farting. Do it, you will feel better. Okay, here we are. So if you allow me nonetheless slowly to come uh, to an end, so what can we do in this situation? Well, uh, obviously, the world is becoming one. The functioning of the un our universe where we have an inside and an outside. Because I think that films like Hunger Games, Elysium are basically right. This is the world that is slowly emerging. Uh, as a conservative, Peter Sloterdijk, but who I claim is not an idiot, uh, nonetheless, developed, the metaphor for today's new world order is that it's global system, but global also in the sense of cupola, a globe, and we are inside, others are outside. The idea that we, the 20%, maybe 25 privileged, live in our safe space and we looked outside and then refugees, of course, are those who penetrate this barrier, coming inside and so on and so on. This is one aspect. The other aspect which worries me today is we were so used when we were younger years ago to criticize Western neocolonialism, how the notions of human rights and so on are really Western imposition, falsifying local, uh, imposing Western values on third world cultures and so on and so on. I think that something new is emerging now, which worries me much more. Phenomena like Modi in India, Putin, Erdogan, and finally Trump himself making part, pact with Saudi Arabia, even China, and so on, demonstrate clearly that a new, genuinely multicultural, but multicultural in a terrible sense, order is emerging where global market can be perfectly combined with each country or civilization living in its own secluded world. For example, that's why it was easy for Trump to make pact with Saudi Arabia and so on and so on. The West even resigned itself to accepting this. It's no longer, it's no longer the old naive Fukuyama idea, we have a vision, global democracy, we have to impose it onto the world. No, we, we can be good multiculturalists to each country, its own values, so while we can be feminists in our countries, we shouldn't mess with other countries if they do horrible things to women and so on and so on. In one of my recent texts, maybe some of you know it, I compared this to a strange phenomenon that I noticed with, uh, with anti-Semitism. 
how today the latest form of antisemitism is Zionist antisemitism. I mean it quite literally. For example, you remember Breivik, the guy, the Norwegian crazy guy who shot uh, uh, 80 social democratic young kids there. He was a representative of this. He said, in Israel, we should fully support the Jews. They protect us from, Ar from uh, Arab barbarism and so on. But not, no Jews here. So here we are anti-Semitic, too many Jews and so on, Jews control too much England, America, but there we should fully support them. And I think what is emerging now with Trump is something parallel, not just anti-Semitic Zionism, but uh, Islamophobic respect for Islam. Look what Trump is doing. At the same time that he spreads this uh, Islamophobic paranoia in the United States, he has no problem making deals with Erdogan, with Saudi Arabia, and so on and so on. So again, it's a new, totally cynical functioning of ideology, which makes critical job very difficult. You remember when American imperialism legitimized itself through human rights and all that, it was relatively easy for us, critics of ideology, but no, but you see, they are lying, their universality of human rights is a false one, it really privileges certain cultural features of Western white masculine culture and so on and so on. Capitalism today no longer needs this. What matters is universal market. What you do at the level of so-called human rights, it's, it's your problem. So that's why, if you allow me some concluding remarks, which will be even more problematic for you, that's why, and a little bit of philosophy in it also, uh, uh, that's why it's crucial today to find the right formula for how to relate universal struggle for emancipation to the plurality of the ways of life. Because that's the problem today. We have, some people even don't like the term way of life. They claim it already sounds of fascism and so on. No, but nonetheless, I think that why are so-called ways of life a fact? Because they are not just ways of life in the sense of abstract cultural identity. They are ways to organize, regulate our, and I use here this term in full, its full psychoanalytic Lacanian sense, our jouissance, excessive enjoyment. Enjoyment if you allow me to improvise a little bit here, enjoyment is for me something, like for Lacan, very paradoxical. It's not the same as pleasure. Enjoyment is, even usually enjoyment in pain, enjoyment is how through pain you deal with pleasure. Uh, let me give you, if you allow me a little bit of impression. <laughs> no, don't tell a madman like me, just go on, because then... <laughs> you are the boss. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, did you read in your newspapers, it was probably reported, I checked it up with my friends in Mexico, and Mexico is a wonderful country, strong progressive movement, I'm not against it. I'm talking about specific examples. In some small city, they want to be not politically correct, but, you know, they want to unite with traditions, I mean, their ancient wisdom, indigenism. So, when you have minor crime acts, they don't simply leave it to state legal system. They have some local reunions of old wise people who know old indigenous rules, and they <coughs> pass the judgment. So, a scandal happened when an older guy raped a young girl. And there was a problem, because these wise old people, well versed in indigenous justice, passed a judgment and condemned the old guy, and the punishment was to buy to the father of the girl, uh, how do you call it, a pack, 12 bottles, a pack of cans of beer. 
and the feminists exploded and so on, but the judges said, sorry, this is our old justice. This is our traditional way of life. And I think it's too easy to trying to find your way out here because uh, I try to reconstruct. Let's go a little bit more in theory so that I don't tell just jokes and politics. Uh, uh, what was the judge's reasoning? Okay, the judge was corrupted. He was paid uh, 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 because, uh, sorry, there is another case which is even worse, a similar one. Uh, a group of young people raped a girl. And one of them was pardoned by the judge. It was corruption, but the reasoning is interesting. One of them was pardoned by a judge because his, no facts were disputed. He admitted. But he claimed, I'm not guilty because I didn't sexually enjoy it. So he admitted, he in a vulgar way, uh, squeezed the breasts of the girl, pushed his fingers into her vagina, but he said, but I didn't penetrate her, I wasn't aroused, I didn't enjoy it. And the judge said, no, then you are not guilty. It's, I think, how to read this, because in my naive, some feminists may accuse me here, but I'm very naive here. Although, if he enjoyed it sexually while raping the girl. It's also, it has to be harshly punished. But I think for me at least, it's just a tiny bit worse if you didn't enjoy it. Then my God, why did you do it then? Obviously just out of evil, to hurt her or to impress your colleagues or whatever. So I claim the premise of the judge was, you can be only Guilty if you enjoyed it. So enjoyment as such is, or pleasure, sexual as such is sinful, makes you guilty. Uh, no enjoyment, no guilt. But I think we should push this even a step further. It's not enough to say no enjoyment, no guilt. We should even say no guilt, no enjoyment. That's the perversity of some type of Catholic morality. If you just do it innocently, you make love, you, it's pleasurable. But it's not real intense enjoyment. To really enjoy it, you must feel guilty. Here, things get so complicated, and I think to analyze all these paradoxes, it's crucial to understand the deadlocks of our consumerism or whatever. Uh, uh, for example, something strange happened recently. A friend of mine from the United States told me he observed a strange phenomenon when he entered a Walmart megastore. It was towards the end of the working day and when he exited the store, he saw many of these shopping carts full of stuff, but abandoned there. And he asked a seller there, what's going on? And the seller says, these are the newly impoverished middle classes who no longer can afford buying commodities there. So they just, as afternoon amusement, they go to the mega store, put things in the cart, and then leave it there and just they, this is a nice example of pure surplus enjoyment without pleasure. That's what Lacan means by surplus enjoyment. Enjoyment in, in a way, enjoyment in procedure itself. The process itself provides enjoyment. And our sexuality is always characterized by this paradox. Let me give you another example. My good friend, the British Lacanian, half Lacanian, half Kleinian, okay, psychoanalyst Darian Leader told me a wonderful anecdote. One of his patients told him of his patients, wonderful sleep of tongue. He wanted to seduce a lady, so he took a lady to a nice restaurant which was part of a hotel. Of course, the idea was I will first invite her to a nice dinner and then suggest why don't we go to a room 
upstairs. But he made the mistake in entering the restaurant, instead of saying, a table for two, please, he said, a bed for two, please. <laughs> now comes the correct interpretation. It's not that his mind was already at sex. Darren Leder guessed in a wonderful way that it was the exact opposite. He was afraid that he will enjoy too much eating and that he will forget where is the true duty, you know. Uh, so it was more to remind himself, be careful, don't enjoy here too much. And this eating in this sense is what Lacan calls objected a, object small a, uh, the surplus enjoyment. That it's necessary, like if you directly make love, if you directly go to sex, it wouldn't have worked. You need the obstacle. That's this paradoxical structure of an obstacle, which as an obstacle is a condition of what it is obstacle to. It's crucial. Let me give you another example. I'm full of examples. <laughs> a lady from Latin America who was maybe flirting with me told me that when her last lover saw her naked, he told her that except for one or two kilos too much, her body is perfect. And I immediately told her, this lady, just don't lose those one of two kilos. Because it's true that those one of two kilos were too much. But through being there as too much, they created the illusion that without these two kilos too much, she would be perfect. But you see the paradox. You take two kilos too much away, you don't get perfect body. You get something totally non-interesting. You see my logic. This is what Lacan calls surplus enjoyment. You add something which ruins the full pleasure, but through ruining it, it creates the phantom of full pleasure. And here, I'm so sorry we don't have time to go into it because my, all my fun is here. Here, Lacan enters Lacanian analysis in, in a specific way which I see as connected with uh, connected with uh, Hegelian dialectics. Why? An example that I like to use, I'm sorry if some of you know it already, an example that I like to use recently. Perfect example of how pleasure functions. Uh, let's take coffee. Let's say you or me, I will say you because I don't like it. Let's say you like coffee. There is a wonderful scene from the film, from uh, 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 yeah, one of the Hollywood classics, Ernst Lubitsch Ninochka. A joke is told there, I'm sorry if you know it, where, uh, everybody knows this joke, a guy enters a rest uh, cafeteria and says, uh, and says, coffee, but coffee without cream, please. And the waiter answers, sorry, we don't have cream, we only have milk, so I cannot give you coffee without cream, I can only give you coffee without milk. And he was totally right, because this is what Hegel means by determinate negation. Although it's materially the same, coffee without milk, it's not the same as coffee without cream. So a simple coffee can be three different things. Coffee, coffee, coffee without cream, coffee without milk. And maybe you are a pervert, I hope you are, in this good sense, that you really enjoy, for some masochist reasons, <coughs> coffee without cream. But it has to be coffee without cream, not just coffee. And I would love you for, let's say you visit us, and my wife or me, I'm here a good feminist, at least here, I bring you coffee and you protest, sorry, this is just coffee. Where is the missing, the missing, milk, or missing cream. milk or cream? Now you will say this is a joke. No, it's not. Because in socialism, where things were always missing in stores, there was one of the wonderful jokes on these motives. It's from Poland, this joke. That somebody enters a store and asks them, uh, did you already get butter? Uh, like, or you still don't have butter. And the uh, lady who is selling things there tells him, sorry, sir, you are in wrong store. We are the store which doesn't have butter. 
No, we are the store which doesn't have, let's say, whatever, sausages. Across the street is the store which doesn't have butter, and so on. So, you see what I mean? What is missing in its absence is part of the identity of what a thing is. And I claim this is especially true for the way we enjoy. We maybe enjoy not just what we do, but the right type of renunciation. That's why, and that's, I claim, how ideology functions today. It provides you, it gives you coffee, but it claims it's coffee without milk, and so on. This abstract spectral element is absolutely crucial element called by Lacan object small a and so on. Another way to approach this, pleasures and so on. You know where enjoyment is inscribed in our way of life, and this always fascinated me. I would love to learn some examples. How does this function here with you in Spain? Uh, because things are very specific here, namely, we all know that to be part of a certain community, it's not enough just to know the rules. In every community, there are always meta rules which tell you what to do with explicit rules, which rules you are allowed to violate, or the opposite, which is even more interesting, which rules offer you something, but you are given a certain freedom on condition that you don't use this freedom. And I claim this, although I generally don't always agree with him, Derrida, Jacques Derrida, in his reading of Kafka, that famous parable in front of the door of the law, made this wonderfully, that uh, law is not just simply the agency that prohibits. At the most fundamental level, law itself is itself prohibited, prohibited to an be announced publicly. If I may repeat an old joke, if you allow me. Imagine, to nice dream, imagine we are in Moscow in 35, I'm Stalin. Okay, what can I do? <laughs> I give a speech. You, you have to, otherwise you disappear, you applaud. Okay, <laughs> then we have a debate. One of you stands up and says, I don't disagree with Comrade Stalin, he made mistakes here. Okay. The next day, the big question would be, who was the last one to see that guy alive, of course. <laughs> but now let's imagine something much more horrible, that then another guy stands up and starts to shout at the first guy. Are you crazy? Don't you know that we in Soviet Union don't criticize Stalin, that it's prohibited? My thesis is the second one would disappear even faster. <laughs> in Stalinism, it wasn't only prohibited to criticize Stalin. It was even more prohibited to publicly announce this prohibition. If you just publicly announce this prohibition, you ruin it. There are prohibitions which function only in this way as non-announced. That's why I think critique of ideology is still actual today, because uh, Today's ideology may appear uh, just offering us coffee, you know, very simple, direct, cynical. No, no. There is at the level of what is left unsaid, what is implied by it. Situation is much more complex. Okay, so now let me really conclude so that we stop. Uh, for me, uh, the problem of a way of life is what? There is a certain leftist vision of some of my friends with which I radically disagree. The vision is this one. We have to be tolerant. We have only to unite people at the level of basic economic political struggle. But as to its specific way of life, every community should be allowed its particular features. They are not threat to the unity of humanity. They bring more wealth to it, you know. We sing these songs, you sing those songs, it's a wonderful wealth, and so on and so on. My problem with these friends of mine is that this analysis works insofar as 
The examples that you use are this neutral one. We have our cuisine, you have your own. We have our songs, you have your own, and so on. But what really defines the way of life is, I think, the organization of sexuality, exchange of partners, and relations of authority, domination. There, I'm so sad I don't have time to go into this, because this is especially actual today, where, when, while, it may appear that our capitalism is getting more and more financial abstract. You know, like things happen at the level of meta speculations with futures, we don't know. Yes, this is true, but that's why, as if because financial speculations get totally detached at the level of relations between the people, direct relations of domination are violently coming back. Slavery is returning, and so on and so on. Uh, but, okay, that's another topic. To conclude, I just want to say this, that, so let's take a community. Let me give you an example of what happened some 15, 20 years ago, I think, in my own country. Uh, Roma, Roma in the sense of the bad word is gypsy. Girl escaped from her home and took refuge with the police. She was 12 years old, claiming my father wants to marry me to his friend. I, okay. Then all the feminists supported her and so on and so on. But then her father, or what is, I think, some elder figure of Roma community, made a very reasonable counter-argument. He said, but listen, arranged marriages between children by parents are the very base of how our community reproduces itself. If you take this away from us, in two, three generations, we disappear. Okay, you can use us to play some bands, to do some spicy food, but we survive as folkloric entity, so, but not as substantial community. So you see the problem. The problem is that we cannot, that's my point, we can, and there are other examples. For example, in India, I was always in trouble because I raised these questions of universality, democracy, criticizing caste system, and it often happened to me that I was then uh, criticized for imposing on them Western imperialist notion. Some of my friends even defend caste system as part of their way of life, which, again, I'm sorry, it's true. So what is my solution? Is my solution then that we should nonetheless impose on others our Western, falsely universal notions of women rights, authority? No, but we should admit something, that this image of all of us participating in some universality while each of us keeps its own way of life is wrong. Universality is inscribed, inscribed as an inner antagonism into each of our ways of life. It's part of it. For example, if in a certain community women rebel their role, this is how universality appears within that community. In Saudi Arabia, it's a modest example, but it's the beginning of something. Women who refuse not to drive, who risk being arrested by driving cars, it's universality. So uh, the point, the, the problem for me is this one. There are no particular ways of life safely in their seclusion and so on and so on. If they are, they are precisely on account of their full inclusion into global world order. Precisely in India, the situation is so interesting. Do you know, for example, that caste system was already disappearing in 17th and 8th century? And then when the British colonized India, they got it immediately what our, some of multiculturalist idiots don't get it, that the strategy of imperialism was never become like us. No, they were horrified by these British colonizers. They knew that if all Indians become like uh, Englishmen, they would have class struggle. No, they want them to remain. So this is why the most horrible, one of the ho most horrible ideological books that I know, 
No, the laws of Manu, a system describing in detail caste system, was reprinted, revitalized in 1840s, 50s, by the British colonizers precisely to keep the locals there in their, in their subjected position of being dominated. So I think, again, that uh, this is why I absolutely reject this idea, global uh, capitalism is universal, so the only way to undermine it is by referring to our particular way of life, indigenous traditions, and so on and so on. This is a very problematic and limited strategy for me. No, we should bring struggle into every particular way of life. We should not say to Saudi Arabia, you are primitive, you have to accept our notions. But we should look where struggles are already going on there, and they are going. In India, you have untouchables and so on. You have people who radically reject caste system and so on. In Saudi Arabia, you have already protests and so on and so on. So I claim that, again, universality is not this UNESCO universality. I hate those UNESCO books on world culture, you know, like uh, we are all one big family of humanity, one culture. Folkloric. Sorry? This is folkloric. Yeah, this folkloric. No, each way of life, each culture is in itself marked by an antagonism caught in a conflict between each particular identity and de facto force of universality, which acts as protest. Protests are always, by definition, authentic protests, universal. And to conclude, you know probably this example of mine, but I like it. You know who is one of my big heroes, of big revolutionaries, I forgot to mention it to you, Malcolm X. You know why, I'm sorry to know this, because of X. He was a Hegelian genius. I'm not bluffing, I met some people who met some people who knew him, and they confirmed this to me. You know what was for Malcolm X, you know, Denzel Washington in the film, so that I speak language which you understand? X, of course, meant we were enslaved, we were torn out of our particular context, African roots, but the genius of Malcolm X was to reject this idea of so let's return to our roots. No, X was not just a sign of tragedy. We are X, we don't have family roots. No, X was for Malcolm X a new chance. X means we, don't, we are not rooted in particular identity. We are free to reinvent our own universality, which will be more authentically universal than white people Western universality. That's why we may disagree here with him. Malcolm X looked for this universality in Islam. So uh, this is the crucial dimension today. We can only fight global capitalism with an even stronger universality. Because every type of indigenism and so on always, believe me, fits perfectly global capitalism. You know who confirmed this to me? I love them. They are among my, my best friends uh, in the United States. Some of, okay, officially we have to call them Native Americans or whatever. They prefer Indians, uh, the term. Did I tell you my old joke why? One of them told me, Native Americans, I hate this term. It means we are nature and what are you, are you white people, cultural Americans or what? They claim if you call us Indians at, le Indians, at least our name is a sign, a proof of white man's stupidity. You know, you thought you were in India when you discovered that. But he told me, this guy, uh, something wonderful. He told me, you know which American tribes can afford to return to their roots. Only those who are lucky enough to have on their reservation mines, minerals, or, or casinos, you know, so that there they get the money to do it. No, I think that I see no contradiction in the fact that Saudi Arabia is at the same time 
It's like you don't have to think about Saudi, Saudi Arabia as a state. It's like big mafia family which deals with not so much oil as financial speculations and so on, but at the same time conservative religiously. And the two, that's crucial, fit perfectly together. So I claim that uh, the big problem today is to define a new universality. I'm here a traditional Marxist. Cap capitalism's big result, we should celebrate it still, is that it dissolved our particular identities, it's opened up universality. And we have to go through this, as it were, through this zero level. We have to, to the only path to freedom is through this proletarian position where you are deprived of your roots. Jacques Derrida quotes a wonderful Jewish joke, and I think we should take it seriously, that uh, on Sabbath or whenever they do it in uh, uh, Jews meet uh, uh, in, uh, and have their uh, confessions, prayers, whatever, doesn't matter, in their synagogue. And one wealthy Jew says, oh God, I may be wealthy, but I'm nobody, I'm nothing, you know, I'm nothing. That another Jew, a famous singer, whatever, says, oh God, it's the same for me, I may be famous, blah, blah, but I'm nothing. And then a poor Jew stands up and says, oh my God, I'm, almost, I'm also nothing. And then one rich Jew says to the other, but who is this guy that he does think that he can say he is also nothing, you know? <laughs> and, you know, this is, and they are right. They want the universality, almost nothing. No, they were right. And here I also have a different attitude towards religion. I'm totally an atheist. Don't be afraid. But you know, when Marx said religion is the opium of the people, not for the people, he said of the people. He was not vulgar in the sense that some rich priests are inventing <laughs> uh, uh, religion, uh, corrupted priests. Uh, you know, Adorno already had this remark, and the other one I find it somewhere, which is the best answer to this. Namely, the idea is this one. Marx said religion is the opium of the people, but today, there are two other opiums of the people. You know which two? Opium and people. <laughs> Many of us, you don't even need ideology. You have opium or some drugs, that's your opium. And uh, people themselves, it's precisely this substantial populist notion, people in this anti-immigrant refugee sense, these are the true opiums of the people today. And the only way to fight them is Again, new universality. Not this abstract uni universality, human rights, but the fighting universality. How are you universal? Not by claiming we are part of a human species, we contribute to it, that's nothing. You are universal where, when you experience the contradiction, the tension, when you are not, you are universal where you protest your particular identity, which is why the universal subject, as Lacan, Jacques Lacan saw it clearly, and here you have a link between politics and psychoanalysis, the universal subject is hysterical subject. What is hysteria at its most elementary? It's, you know, Louis Althusser's theory of interpolation, like ideology interpolates you into something, you are a woman, a teacher, a Christian, whatever. Today you are an uh, enlightened Buddhist hedonist, that's okay. But uh, 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 the basic hysterical question is, why am I what you are saying that I am? This doubt about my own particular symbolic identity. That's how feminism begins. Society is telling traditional patriarchal society to a woman, you are this, your role in the family, blah, blah, blah. And the simple question is, why am I what you are saying that I am? This, here, when you start to raise this question, you emerge as a universal subject. I would even say you emerge as in Cartesian cogito. That's why, there's so many interests interesting thing in history of philosophy. 
You know, this is the secret of Descartes. Do you know that Cartesian philosophy was extremely popular among women? Okay, those rich women who were able to read him. But immediately women saw, one of the French women ladies immediately said why she likes Descartes. She said, because Cogito doesn't have a sex. You don't, the whole Cartesian philosophy is based on this doubting my identity. Am I really what you are saying that I am? That's why I am again so worried about this allegedly emancipatory potential of uh, identities, like, uh, you know, like I am bisexual or transgender and okay, perfect, but uh, like I, I think that this statement has an emancipatory potential only if it echoes a universal dimension. Like if you say I am transgender and I suffer because of it, but I, my suffering is in some way exemplary of what is wrong with our society, of the falsity of universal functioning, of sexual difference, whatever, and so on and so on. I don't think that any particularity as such has emancipatory dimension in itself. Gilles Deleuze knew this, although he is a poet of what, this uh, multidimensional whatever. When Gilles Deleuze, and to conclude really, believe me or not, I will conclude now. Uh, 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 that's why, for example, now it's fashionable to be for polyamory, you know, like, not just one, I love you, 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 you differ. No, I'm still for singular li love. You know why? Because this polyamory is simply particular. I love you for this, I love you for this, and so on. But I'm very romantic here. True love is not this. True love is not I like you for this, but I have other needs, so I need another partner or whatever. True love is a much more desperate, radical stance. True love means I want to be with you because I simply cannot survive without you. It's total despair. I cannot imagine my life outside without you. And that's what today is more and more threatened, this crazy, radical love. Okay, I can, could go on indefinitely, but, you know, like... Let's stop. I'm very grateful to you for your incredible patience of tolerating an obvious madman like me. <laughs> At least I will give you one final joke. Can you imagine some stupid students of mine? Why stupid? Because they told me, oh, professor, you, I, you convinced me with your knowledge of Lacan. Would you accept me as your patient, you know? Well, my answer is always double. First. If you think I could be your analyst with my obvious madness, uh, then you really need psychiatric help, no? And my second joke is, uh, with me talking all the time, can you really imagine me just listening to another person for, for more than... Thank you very much. yet in communism. When we will take over, you will have to applaud the leader. Not now. <laughs> now you can stop. Okay. Eh, muchas gracias. Sí, te diría a la, a la organización, que no sé si está previsto, los traductores han tenido una tarde exigente. Por si acaso hay preguntas en castellano, no sé si está prevista una traducción inversa. En caso de que fuese así, eh, igual ayuda. Gracias, Sonia. But you uh, entiendo un poco. I, I, I also know, no, I cannot resist it, an absolute vulgarity to conclude. I was in Argentina, that's the finesse of my knowing Spanish, that you know the verb coger. Here it means just to look yeah. for, to search. In Argentina, as you probably know, is the F word. Okay, so that's my preferred Argentinian joke. One of you idiots, Spanish, comes to Argentina and asks, 
¿dónde puedo coger un taxi? Y no es el argentino answer, you can try into the exhaust fume, you know. That's the limit of my Spanish. <laughs> okay. Let's see if it works. Uh -huh. Thanks. I'm going to summarize your, your talk in order you to, to test if it works. You ah, know what okay. I mean? Two, yes. And where is the voice? Ah, yeah. channel? No, volume yeah. is here. Yeah, yeah. I think it's okay. I think it's okay. I'm going to talk in Spanish and so yeah, you yeah. can test if they, they do. Yes. Bueno. bueno, mientras se mientras, eh, ordena un poco el, el turno de preguntas, eh, supongo que habrá un micrófono, yo querría, querría insistir en, en el agradecimiento a Gijek por, por esta charla en la que, en la que ha puesto en juego eh, algunas, de, algunas de las claves de, de su pensamiento. ¿no? La verdad es que es, es realmente placentero escuchar ¿no? cómo se usa universal, universal concreto, negación determinada o la diferencia entre placer y goce en Lacan y darle un uso político, agudo y a la vez gracioso. Eh, en esta charla él, él ha puesto en juego también lo importante de la revolución, que es la manera en la que transforme de manera efectiva la, la vida cotidiana de las personas, que también me parece, me parece un acierto, ¿no? me, me ha parecido, solo quería subrayar eso antes de dar paso a las, a las preguntas, una charla muy representativa de su pensamiento, muy aguda y en la que, ya digo, ha puesto en juego eh, algunas de, de las fórmulas que en filosofía tenemos problemas para explicar con ejemplos. Él lo hace, en mi opinión, con, con pertinencia y con agudeza y, y de una manera muy, muy graciosa y muy interesante. ¿no? Y yo creo que ha movilizado algunos de los principales problemas de, no solo de, de la izquierda, sino de, bueno, de, de los seres humanos. ¿no? Eh, cómo, cómo gestionar el poder, cómo ganar el poder cómo transformar nuestras vidas en, en un mundo en el que bueno, se, se ha fragmentado todo, se ha desactivado a veces la, la ilusión y la esperanza y, y ha denunciado muy bien cómo el cinismo es siempre eh, parte de una ideología conservadora. Ya digo, eh, creo que el protagonista es él y ahora os toca a vosotros, entonces bueno, no sé si hay preguntas, quizá el procedimiento de levantar la mano, y habrá micrófonos. Hello, uh, thank you. I'm speaking in English so you can take. <laughs> uh, thank you for all your fantastic ideas and uh, <laughs> the ideas of the madman. I agree with most of them. And, but, um, but. <laughs> I agree. No, I, well, I agree. No, there's no but. I just want to ask you because um, uh, your ideas about the universalism, um, I'm just wanting to know if you agree with something I've deduced from that. Mm -hmm because you're also a lover of cinema. Uh, thinking of a future politics, what kind of plan can we use to drive us, what kind of purpose can there be for this future ideology, universal ideology? And my idea is that uh, it could be Star Trek. It could be, sorry? Star Trek. Ah, yeah, Star Trek. Yeah, the, the, the Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And um, the first thing about Star Trek is how do we get to, to, to the Star Trek, Star Trek civilization and uh, I think the first thing you have to do is abolish money. So you have to go beyond the, the pragmatism that we have today of uh, that money is important and then we, you know, we can use our robots and everything and we don't have to work as you mentioned before. Uh, it's a wonderful question which means that it's a difficult question. About universality, I must clarify one possible misunderstanding. Uh, I was not advocating universality in the sense of raising to a higher level, abstracting from our particular condition. Look, I don't like Salman Rushdie too much. He went way too much into liberalism for me. But once he did give, and even not here, but in Bilbao, so for the time being still part of Spain. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He gave a wonderful answer to the question. Somebody accused him of uh, not 
being faithful to his Indian roots, to, you know, being too much now part of the liberal London United Kingdom tradition. And then he said something wonderful. There I do admire him. He said that, uh, no, it's not true. Two Indian, great Indian writers were absolutely crucial influence on him. Which two? Jane Austen and Charles Dickens. And he explained this wonderfully. He said, Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist, all those poor kids wandering, that's suburbs of Bombay today. That's the best image. And he said, this upper middle class families fighting who will marry whom, this is Jane Austen and so on. That's for me the true universality. Let's take Shakespeare, for example. True universality is not you abstract from concrete conditions. True universality is how a work of art which is very specific, clearly rooted in certain historical situation, can be wonderfully, can be reborn in another context where it works in a wonderful way. And this is, I think, for example, the wonder of Shakespeare for me, how you can get then a romantic, a modern, whatever, all hamlets you can get, all others you can get. So again, uh, this is for me universality. The miracle is that to be a universal writer, you don't have to think about, my God, this is too much rooted in my context, how will I will make it too more universal. If you do this, it will be absolutely provincial. You can be sure, you know. Just, you must be absolutely particular in your world, but in a way which from within finds echo in other words, and so on, and so on. That would be just the point about universality. What you said about uh, all this, uh, uh, I don't, I must say, I confess my sin, nobody is perfect. Don't kill me for this. I was never able to really integrate to watch serially uh, Star Trek. So you can, but I must tell you uh, something else that, and this is not Star Trek. I'm talking about another thing. Some people think that all these catastrophic <laughs> science movies, you know, all this variation of there is some either civil war, atomic explosion, whatever, and the old civilization is wiped out and out of its ruins a new civilization will emerge. I don't think there is anything progressive in it. I think it's precisely a radical capitalist dream of, to begin from the zero point. Because then what emerges is exactly the same society as the old one just purified of its uh, sins or whatever. There is even another thing, and I want to provoke you here, another example of jouissance, much more problematic. I now watch, okay, the first season is over. Uh, did you watch that famous Margaret Atwood novel? It was a movie now, Handmaid's Tale. Okay, let me provoke you with something. I enjoy it, but all of a sudden I caught myself enjoying it too much. <laughs> and I asked myself, okay, all liberals who enjoy it have an official justification for it. You know, it's a warning. It shows dark potential of Christian conservatism. But Frankly, when I watch it, I'm absolutely fascinated how this world functions, and I like all the details, how, you know, women, <coughs> sorry, women not allowed to read, so how they communicate this, that, and basically it's a strange fascination, and I don't think it's critical. I think that uh, this is often the problem with movies who like to portray evil but do it in a suspiciously fascinated way. For example, do you remember that Oliver Stone movie which was famous 20 years ago, then he did, uh, Wall Street. Uh, the bad guy, Michael Douglas, you know, greet his, all those 
legendary statement will become part of the common wisdom from the film, like, if you need a friend, buy yourself a dog, greed is good, whatever. The, it's, they are pronounced by the bad guy. Officially, you're supposed to see him, Michael Douglas, as horror, but he's absolutely the only fascinating person. And there something I find has to be done. I think there is something absolutely wrong in this secret fascination, in this secret fascination with evil. I, I also, I find, okay, I will not go into it, but what I'm saying is that even when Hollywood appears at its relatively progressive and so on, it, it's usually very suspicious. That's why I don't like what I ironically call Hollywood Marxism, you know, all those movies about the end of the world or whatever. <laughs> Poor. But there is something wrong in the very fascination with this evil world and so on. So one way to counteract it would have been, I wonder to, to, uh, if I can repair a little bit of shocking cultural lack, but don't worry, that's how, that's how I treat my son, you know. I told him, uh, if you don't know who wrote Oedipus or uh, Divina Commedia, well, it's okay. But if you don't know the difference between first and second version of Hitchcock's The Man Who Knew Too Much, you are out, you know. So along the same, at the same level, with uh, science fiction, uh, and all these mythic worlds, you know what would really interest me to do? Don't now denounce me as a Stalinist, but for example, to, it's my old temptation, I warn you, to rewrote, or okay, I don't have billions to reshoot it, Star Wars presenting uh, Palpatine and Darth Vader as good, progressive, egalitarian centralist fighting reactionary feudalist, all those Jedi bullshit particulars, to, to do, tell totally the opposite story from the other's point. What if, what do they stand for? All that, Republic, blah, blah. What strange of Republic is Republic when you have Princess Leia, knights, kings, and so on? No. We, Palpatine, the Emperor, and Darth Vader, they are, my God, progressive Bonapartist revolutionaries trying to get rid of the old world, you know. That's how it, it this is my old obsession, just to, to turn it around, you know. In, in this sense, for example, I liked, I, I, sorry? Uh, you know what I'm afraid of? Let me answer you with one of my, up, I'm sorry if you know it, one of my favorite uh, Stalinist jokes. It's a joke from Soviet Union in mid-30s, precisely this. They have a debate, that's the joke, they have a debate in 35 in Politburo, will there be money in communism or not? Then you have right-wingers, Bukharin pupils who claim, of course, it has to be money. It's natural to have money. You cannot exchange commodities, no? Then the left-wingers, some followers still there of Trotsky said, no, money is alienation in communism, no money. Then Comrade Stalin intervenes and says, you are both wrong. Here we have right-wing deviation and left-wing deviation. The truth is, as they say in Stalinism, dialectical synthesis of the opposites. In communism, there will be money and there will not be money. Okay, then they ask him, but Comrade Stalin, how do you mean this? And you can guess what Stalin says. Very simply, some people will have money, other people will not have money. <laughs> no, but quite seriously now. I, I am not people, I agree with you. People who think we cannot get beyond money and so on are wrong. If something is happening, read authors who are way too simple, like Paul Mason, Jeremiah Rifkin, but they see some tendency, which is that exactly with what they called uh, Internet of Things and this 
zero reproduction, when you can reproduce a phenomenon without additional costs, that money no longer functions because, look, with this glass of water, money and competition works because if I drink it, you will not drink it and vice versa. But knowledge is not money. Knowledge, is, if you know it, I don't lose any of my knowledge. Maybe you will say something and you will be even more knowledge and so on. So I effectively think that now what is happening with this digitalization and so on, paradoxically, is a way where money no longer can play its role. Which is why, as we see, intellectual property is, I think, one of the unsolvable problems for capitalism. They will not be able to uh, commodify so-called intellectual property. I told, the problem that I see is another one that I already hinted at. Whatever we say about money, and Marx was well aware, sorry, aware of it, it has one, I wouldn't say good feature, but that we no longer have direct relations of domination. We don't need them because you can dominate me through money and so on. But that's why we have at least formal freedom and so on. The danger is that if you abolish money or limit its role in the wrong way, direct personal relations of domination will violently return. Didn't this happen, for example, in Soviet Union? Uh, there was money, but de facto, money was limited. For example, you had a certain salary. But this didn't really matter under Stalinism. What matters is, for example, if you were a top scientist, you get special allowances where you go for a holiday. Or It was the whole parallel distribution of wealth done outside market in a different way. That's what I see as a problem, that it's how to abolish money without returning to some form of direct relations of domination. That's, sorry, I, let's go, okay. Mm -hmm. There are more uh, questions, maybe? Yeah. Hello, Slavo, I'm here. Ah, sorry, yeah, yeah. I'm going to make the question. I see you are on the center left, no? <laughs> From radical left, sorry, to center. No, radical right, whatever, sorry. <laughs> Please, yes. Okay, I'm going to make the question in Spanish if you don't care because... Oh, I... Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Eh, bueno, cuando has... Al principio de la charla de, de este día después, de el V de Vendetta parte 2, eh, se me viene a la cabeza una batalla que ha habido aquí en España eh, con Podemos, Hace un tiempo, hace unos meses, eh, se disputó una, una batalla que, en la que había básicamente un bando que defendía a grandes rasgos una, una apuesta por la institución, una apuesta eh, porque el cambio solo se consolidaría si se institucionalizaba, bla, 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 y otro bando que quizá era más, eh, más eh, apegado al, a la manifestación, a, a la ebullición social, ¿no? Bueno, creo que se llegó como a un equilibrio, a una especie de, de armonía entre estas dos partes. Eh, una que te permitía consolidar cambios, pero por otro, par, eh, por otro lado te, te obligaba a estar en permanente con, eh, contacto con, con la sociedad y no burocratizarte del todo. En tu opinión, eh, no, 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 no sé si eh, alegas por una burocracia absoluta en la que ni siquiera haya una parte apegada a, a las manifestaciones, a los movimientos sociales, etcétera, etcétera. Y en ese caso, ¿cómo podrían, cómo podría no surgir de nuevo la, la queja que dio inicio a Podemos, que era quizá la apelación a unas élites que se habían separado demasiado de, de, del, del pueblo? ¿Cómo sí. podría no volver a surgir otro Podemos debido a esta, a esta burocracia total nueva? Thank you. No, I see your, sorry. I see the problem here, and maybe the answer will not satisfy you, but let me first begin with an observation. Uh, you know, maybe I miss something, so I want to be very careful here. On the one hand, I see this idea of if you simply accept the power game, you become just another political party, ossified, and so on, and so on. But what I'm no less afraid is that if you say, let's stay outside in our local communities and so on and so on, that 
it's for me a too easy solution. You leave the power to itself. If you don't have a concrete vision of what to do in the long term with state power. And that's what, maybe you can help me, I'm very sincere here, with all my absolute sympathies for Podemos and so on. That's uh, where I don't see, okay, but maybe even I'm too violent here to ask this question. What I don't see is maybe too violent, but what does Podemos want? Does it want power or not? If it doesn't want power, then what does it want? Does it want to be just some kind of a critical corrective to power? Okay, let me put it in another way. Let's say that through some miracle, whatever, the last elections, Podemos won. And through some other small leftist groups, it takes power. What would it done then? Would it say, no, sorry, guys, we don't want to become part of institutional power, we just step down or what? If they were to stay in power, how would they have done it? But uh, my solution here is why is not that we have clearly uh, to, take, to take sides here. I think just be ruthless. We want everything. Let's keep social movements and let's gra grab power wherever we can. I think we should avoid this dilemma as if, you know, we have to choose clearly. For example, I will not name them, but I, I think one of the most tragic things is, I will not name them, but some very well-known leftists today, big names, when you speak with them privately, they give you a very sad vision. They claim that uh, simply the fact that even if we have a crisis now, there is no revolutionary potential and so on, uh, means that we cannot change anything in democratic way. So the only thing is to sit down, getting ready, and be prepared for some big catastrophe, war, ecological catastrophe, which will give us a chance to grab power, to take over. And some of them, I will not name them, even went a step further and whispered into my ear, but maybe we should organize this incident. Like, we should maybe risk hundreds of thousands of lives to trigger a mega, I don't know, explode a uh, uh, nuclear reactor or whatever to, to trigger it. So uh, my position here is, you know what? Uh, like, uh, don't get caught in these abstract dilemmas. Like, uh, I would say, of course, the situation is contradictory, but that's politics. Try everything. On the one hand, if you can keep alive this social base, civil society networks, wonderful. But why not, nonetheless, grab power wherever you can? It's possible to combine them. I will give you an example. Good friend of mine, and also that's why he's good friends of mine. I'm a monster. I only have good friends who are theorists. Uh, yes. um, Alvaro Garcia Linera, the vice president of Bolivia. He plays wonderfully this game. They, the uh, Evo Morales regime there, they try to keep alive their social contact, base, and so on. But they are at the same time aware of the critical limitations of this, you know. For example, Linera told me, don't trust too much all those native tribes who, uh, they get corrupted, most of them, <laughs> he told me, and so on. But at the same time, they use brutally where they can central state power. I think our ideal should not be either or. Why not all? Why not have strong state power and social movements? I, I think it can be done. Even good populists sometimes succeeded in doing it. So again, uh, another thing I try to develop lately is that there are many, this is my hope, if you say a big revolution, it's a cheap position. It means basically nothing, you know. But isn't the art to, in each concrete society, in each situation, 
to ask something that would have been for me today an ideal political act. To act, to choose a topic, a task, which appears as innocent as possible, but in reality it can trigger a big process. This is, at this level, and I have no illusions about Obama, that's the example I often use, Obama health care. It's nothing revolutionary. He was able to say, wait a minute, most of Europe has it, uh, Canada has it. But it was such a trauma for the United States that now the first thing Trump is doing is to repeal it, uh, uh, and so on and so on. So the, I, in one of my texts, I use this example of science fiction where, you know, you enter a room with many buttons, but then you press the wrong button and the whole room disintegrates like it's the pro prohibited button. We should find this good, appropriate, particular demand. Like, again, in the United States, where they are obsessed with their own individualist notion of freedom and so on and so on, Universal health care, health care was obviously way too provocative, was obviously a way too provocative idea. So again, we should do things like this. Find issues which are apparently modest. Nobody can accuse you of anything, but they trigger a process. These are the real changes, I claim. Not if you immediately opt for a big change, it, de facto, it means nothing. Because it means let's comfortably wait. So my defense of Podemos would have been that uh, this dilemma debate that you presented, this is our predicament today. On the one hand, we cannot simply say we will enjoy our comfortable position of true civil society because this de facto means let's have the state the way it is, no? We don't do this, but also we must be aware of the limits of state power. And we have to find a way with this contradiction. Again, the main point for me would be to reject this as a choice. Why not have it both, you know? The best political motto for me is still, I think, the English have one proverb like this, coffee or tea, yes please. You know, like state power or civil society, yes please. Siento, siento ejercer de polimalo, pero me piden que solo haya una pregunta más. Eh, se me ocurre, veo al menos dos manos ahora, si podéis ser breves, quizá podamos unir las dos, eh, por ir una a cada lado y que se contesten. ¿No? Ok. okay. Hacemos, uh, sí, si os parece, porque tres es un número dialécticamente interesante. I know, I know what I will do. I will give you some Zen Buddhist shit, you know, like my answer will be listen to my silence or clap with one hand, you know, like, sorry, please give me the answer. Yeah, yeah. The question. Hay muchas. Hacemos una cosa, hay muchas. Por favor, tres seguidas, breves, y que las conteste en la medida que sea posible de manera unificada. Okay, so you were talking about the problem uh, about we can want both things, okay? Both the state yeah, yeah. and both the, like the social movements of whatever. Yeah. But there's one problem with bureaucracy and with the huge level of bureaucracy in which we live since mainly yeah, yeah. after the Second World War or whatever, that is that the same bureaucratic state destroys a lot of the stuff that you need to be a leftish. Like, for example, this capacity to have um, a strong individual being. I think we feel overwhelmed by bureaucracy. And I feel that you see this conflict inside politics, not just uh, inside the conflict between left and right, but also you see the conflict inside the same left. Yeah, yeah. Because the people who want to rule are the main ones who want to destroy the movements. So what happened with that? What happened if when you can't have coffee and tea because coffee and tea are struggling with themselves? Okay. Uh, yeah. No, but nonetheless, please, it would be, let's go a little bit longer because I would like to answer you directly. Okay, but very brutally, what would you have done here? What's your solution here? 
I think you have to strive for coffee and tea because what will you say? People who want to rule want to destroy us. So, okay, what's then your solution? I have a very naive solution that get the people who will rule us in such a way that they will not destroy us. It's a very naive position, but I think because then the only solution is let's not rule, which means another, maybe even worse people, will rule. And that's what I want absolutely to avoid. This comfortable position, people rule there, while we are comfortably in a civil society, don't. Our hands have to get totally dirty with ruling. I'm not afraid of that. But when you said bureaucracy and so on, but listen, uh, I'm not, I don't think that bureaucracy cannot look at a country like Switzerland. I don't idealize, it's a proto-fascist country or whatever. But nonetheless, it did succeed, or some other countries like Norway and so on. As far as I can see, they did succeed in bringing together a certain level of civil society mobilization with very efficient uh, bureaucracy. The, and even now comes my paradox. When there is the conflict between the two, I'm often even on the side of bureaucracy. Don't forget that because of this popular tradition of civil society, in Switzerland, women got the right to vote only in mid-60s or whatever. Sorry? 70, 71 even, yes. So you see what I am afraid of. I am afraid of, if you say, those who rule want to lead, want to destroy us, the problem, I'm not saying that we should use the state the way it is. We should transform it and so on. But I think the battle is not lost because with the complexity on today's situation, we need some type of, okay, maybe bureaucracy is not the right word. By bureaucracy, I simply mean a complex structure of administration which is not totally transparent to us local people. Uh, I find here many solutions and maybe it will bring me a lot of trouble if I name them. One solution would be an inverted Stalinist one. That to have uh, what Stalin was doing but in not such a terrorist way. Be aware when you have people who lead you that there are also other people who control these people, support factional struggles, a little bit of terror, not against the people, but against those who lead us. I think that this is a nice tradition of some progressive states where, okay, you lead, but usually you will lose your head for it. That would be, why not, one formula. Okay, let's go. Another one. You promised three. Hacemos eso. Con Por favor, preguntáis dos, me están pidiendo que acabemos ya. Sois breves y contestas de manera unificada. ¿Sí? Yo voy a preguntar en I español. Spoke on behalf of the people. Who are you to tell me to be short yet? You told me, you told me I was the boss. <laughs> Sorry, so who is the next one? Bueno, veo que ninguna mujer se atreve a preguntarte nada, así que voy a empezar. Bueno, en primer lugar, darte las gracias porque veo que has nombrado a las mujeres algunas veces, cosa que es muy raro en los filósofos hombres. En segundo lugar, eh, preguntarte cuál es la solución para combatir el patriarcado y la violencia machista. Y luego, en tercer lugar, si conocías la existencia del Partido Feminista de España. Y ya con esto termino. Yes. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hello. <coughs> um, yo te quería preguntar muy brevemente porque um, se ha mencionado estaba en la superficie por decirlo de alguna forma de la charla de alguna forma cuando hablabas del estalinismo cuando hablabas de la burocracia yo no puedo evitar recordar eh, recordar a la oposición de izquierdas que encabezó León, León Trotsky. Y, y todo el papel que, que jugaron, y sencillamente te quería preguntar cuál es tu opinión sobre eh, la oposición de izquierdas eh, soviética, eh, León Trotsky y eh, so on, so on. No. Ok, no, it's a nice question, but you know, recently I read a biography Isaac Deutscher, Isaac Deutscher, maybe the best known, 
sympathetic of Trotsky. And you know what shocked me there? That was for me Trotsky's biggest failure. Of course I sympathize with him, all that goes by itself, but uh, uh, precisely Trotsky simply, the crucial year in Soviet Union was for me 22-23. Why? Lenin got the first stroke. And it's a very tragic, almost Greek tragedy story. You know what then happened, you must know. Lenin, this was typical for Lenin's ethics, he and Nadezhda Krupskaya, his wife, wrote a letter to Politburo demanding poison. They said, I'm incapacitated, I cannot work politically, and for me, politics is only life I know, so please give us some poison that we kill ourselves. Stalin sabotaged it, you know why? Because he knew it. If at that point Lenin were to die, and they would have to decide who will be the follower, then Stalin probably wouldn't yet have won. He needed another year, year and a half. And in that year, only in year 23, That. Then, when he was strong enough, the end of 22, Stalin wanted to get Le Lenin dead. He started to insult Lenin, uh, spoke dirty to Nadezhda Krupskaya to humiliate Lenin. But you see, Stalin was aware of this. And I read those uh, memoirs by Georgi Dimitrov, the boss of uh, International, where he reports how Stalin once said at the meeting, narrow meeting, of course, that. Trotsky was undoubtedly more popular in mid-twenties than he, Stalin. But he said, cadre, they supported me, that was crucial. Stalin, and this was the tragedy of Trotsky. He was, he didn't have the sensibility for this. Like, uh, from 23 at the sessions of Politburo, you know what Trotsky was doing to show his arrogance? I took this from Deutscher. He, brought to the session of Politburo's French classic, Flaubert, uh, Stendhal, in French, and read them there to show, like, oh, I'm with this, fuck you, you primitive. <laughs> but, you know, Trotsky was at that point, like the example that I always use, that cat who is walking above the precipice and doesn't know it's already walking in empty air. This is what Trotsky was missing, you know, like, he, why wasn't he more attentive to how Stalin is de facto grabbing power? That was, for me, the true tragedy of Trotsky. How he totally lost, didn't have, didn't have this uh, sensitivity there. Uh, as for, uh, sorry, woman, yes. I'm so sad we don't have more time for this. At least I'm here clear in the sense that I wrote maybe even too much about sexual difference and so on. But you know, from my American training, training in the sense that I have no training, that it, I'm often there, uh, you know what the problem would have been? Like uh, some American radical feminists, or they wouldn't even call themselves feminists, they would say transgender against heteros, they would have said, no, feminist party still implies the opposition feminine, masculine. We have to undermine this opposition itself, then you get transgenderists, the same toilets, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, uh, so uh, I think, uh, my position is here, first, uh, that uh, the most dangerous form of threat to radical, authentic feminism today is uh, on the one hand, that it's sometimes blind against a certain post-patriarchy which is emerging today, but which is in a way still, how should I put it, secretly anti-emancipatory and so on and so on. Okay, I'll put it clearly in these terms, and I put it as provocatively and openly as I can. My problem with Judith Butler, with whom I have good personal relations and so on, no problem there, is this one. What is my basic reproach to her? It's that what she is describing as her 
model of how subjectivity is built. There are no in advance given sexual roles weak through, through performative games of paradigm imitation. We all the time reconstruct ourselves, construct ourselves in our always fragile sexual identities and so on and so on. What I suspect is that she is not describing a utopian goal, but simply the ideal figure of today's late capitalist society. I think that what idiots like Trump and all those moral majority conservatives advocate, it's of course ridiculous, but it's a lost battle. This type of, uh, this type of performativity where we have no fixed identities and so on and so on, I don't see it as a very uh, progressive model. I think it fits perfectly, again, today's ideology, which is precisely the ideology of you have no fixed identity, discover potentials in yourself, reconstruct yourself all the time, and so on and so on. So, uh, so uh, the problem here for me is this one. On the one hand, of course, we all agree. In some sense, Judith Butler is right. We should not appeal when we fight for feminism to some, I don't know, deeper feminine essence or whatever. But at the same time, where I don't agree with Judith Butler type of performative feminism, which at the end even undermines itself, she doesn't want even to be called as feminist, is that, uh, uh, sorry, another problem today, and Alain Badiou, I think, was right to draw attention to it, is that today, a certain image of woman as a human face of power is emerging, which I think is an obscene betrayal of feminism, but it is one of the new ideological functions of woman. Like, but you make in a book on youth, I don't know if it's translated into your language already, he makes this wonderful observation that in French system of oppressing the young delinquents. Women play a crucial role. The judge, the social worker, the psychologist, they're usually women and all this ideology, you know, we don't want just to punish you, we want to re-educate you and so on and so on. It's, uh, I put it like this, another identity is offered here to women to stand for power with the human face and so on and so on which should also be rejected. But where I absolutely agree, apropos uh, feminism, is that this, uh, I think, for theoretical reasons, and this brought me a lot of trouble, which, in which I don't have time to go now, that sexual difference cannot be reduced to what they claim gender roles. Masculine and feminine is a stronger ontological opposition, not natural. It's still something specific to human symbolic universe, but it cannot be reduced just to this, like, oh, we have, like, in New York now it's legalized. In the state of New York, you have now recognized legally 32 sexual identities, and they like to make, point out how masculine and feminine are just two in the middle. You have boots, gay, lesbian, bisexual, trisexual, asexual, all that. No, I think that sexual difference names some antagonism which is stronger than this. Sexual difference is not just the result of this performative games and so on and so on. And my proof is this one. As the way Judith Butler is sometimes read, she is much more intelligent, in this playful way, we construct our sexual identities and so on. My God, I met some of them. How can they write this? Did they meet any really suffering transgender people? Why? Because let's say biologically they appear to be a woman, but subjectively they experience themselves as men or something third and so on. And 
It's not for them a simple choice. I play a performative game today, I am a woman, tomorrow I'm a bisexual, and so on. For them, this psychological identity is so strong, they cannot escape it, that they are ready to suffer, to go through horrible, painful sex change operations, and so on. This is what you have to accept. Yes, our identity is not natural. But this doesn't mean that it's simply a question of social games playing. Tomorrow I am a man, the day after I am bisexual, then I am a woman. You know, true freedom is in a way to choose your destiny, to choose something from which you almost, uh, you almost cannot escape. But just to give you another thing, now this is anecdotal. Why? I, maybe this still means that I'm secretly anti-feminist, but why I don't have any problems with women, especially in pure theory. Look, one of my great references you pointed out is Hegel, Hegelian. Sorry to tell you, but the five greatest books on Hegel in last 30 years were all written by women. Jacqueline, uh, no, the sister uh, who died. Gillian Rose, Hegel Contra Sociology, Beatrice Longanes, Hegel and the Critic of Metaphysics, Catherine Malabu, Malabu, The Future of Hegel, then you have Rebecca Comey, Melancholy Morning or whatever, an excellent book, and my Slovene colleague, Alenka Zupancic, her new book. Isn't this a wonderful thing? It means something that, it's not that women are good for this self-expressive bullshit, you know, how you feel something. No! Women, if there is a philosopher who stands for pure conceptual thinking, it's Hegel. What does it mean that all great Hegelians are, are women today? It must mean something. <laughs> 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 <laughs>